Okay, so <clears throat> we saw that um, the adrenal gland is under the, the influence of the hormones of the anterior pituitary gland. Okay, so um, most importantly, the ACTH, okay? And what, when we take the adrenal gland, um, I'm sure we already know the anatomy of the adrenal gland. It's located just um, above the kidneys, or on top of the kidneys. And the adrenal gland is just like the kidneys. So, I mean, in terms of uh, morphology, okay? So it also has the cortex and then the middle, just like the kidneys. And the hormones produced by the adrenal cortex um, are different from the, the hormones produced by the adrenal medulla, okay? Remember the adrenal medulla produces um, epinephrine, um, I mean, um, adrenaline, no adrenaline, okay? And then the, the, the adrenal cortex, as we saw from our discussion yesterday, Okay, we said it, it had three parts, the glomerulosa, the fascicularis, I hope, I hope I'm right, and the reticularis or something like that. Is it fasciculata or something? One of those. Okay, and they all produce hormones. And the hormones that are produced by the adrenal cortex are... Um, we can group them as the mineralocorticoids, the glucocorticoids, and then the, the sex hormones, okay? And then I said the mineralocorticoids are uh, mainly responsible for uh, the regulation of minerals, okay? Or the ions, like potassium and sodium. And then the glucocorticoid is responsible for um, glucose regulation, okay? And then we, we know what the sex hormones are for. Okay, and we, we know what the sex hormones are for. Good. So I, I, I also said that some of these hormones that we are going to see, especially from the adrenal cortex, okay? They don't only have glucocorticoid function, okay? So some of them have glucocorticoid function with some mineralocorticoid function, okay, and vice versa. Okay, good. Now, for the mineralocorticoid, the prototype we use is aldosterone. So aldosterone is the key uh, mineralocorticoid, okay? And for the gluco glucocorticoid, we use cortisol. So cortisol is the, is the prototype that we, we discuss. So remember that Though cortisol mainly acts as a glucocorticoid, it also has a, a mineralocorticoid of, um, action. Okay, good. So the disease of the adrenal cortex can be divided broadly into two. Um, we have the hyperfunctioning of the gland, where the gland produces excess hormones, okay? And we also have the hypofunctioning of the adrenal gland which is called the adrenal insufficiency okay good so we'll be looking at disease of the adrenal glands which leads to increase uh, which leads to increase adrenal hormone production and those that leads to a reduced adrenal hormone production okay so the ones which are caused by the the increased production or the hyperfunction, there are two. We have the Cushing's um, syndrome and then the Korn syndrome, okay? Um, Cushing's syndrome, high levels of um, uh, cortisol, that is glucocorticoid. Korn's disease, high levels of aldosterone, which is mineralocorticoid, okay? Good. Then, then we have the hypofunction. The hypofunction is the adrenal insufficiency, which we call the Addison's um, disease, okay? So now, this part is very important for you to understand. You see, when it comes to 
the adrenal cortex diseases. There are a lot of tests that you could do. Okay, so if you don't organize it in your mind, like you just get confused. Okay, so we we divide the test we we, we do into two. Some of the tests are screening tests, and others are confirmatory tests. Okay, so the first the first test, which is the screening test, it just screens you. Okay, and when it's done screening you, then we take you through the confirmatory test, and that com actually confirms that you have the disease. So we should know which of the tests are screening tests and which of the tests are confirmatory tests. Okay. Good. And we have we have what is called there is also an, another group of disease which is called the congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and this this um, leads to increased depending on the type. Okay, it can cause um, increased production of almost all the hormones, including the sex hormones. Okay. So these are some of the things you are going to look at this evening. Okay, please, any questions so far? So as I've done, I've just given you the, the general overview of what we are going to do, okay? Anyone with any questions so far? Okay, I don't think so. Good. So I've, I've already talked about this, that we have the adrenal cortex and then the adrenal medulla okay and the cortex produce the glucocorticoid which i said cortisol mineral corticoid which is aldosterone and the, the androgens okay remember all these are steroid hormones all these are steroid hormones and their secretions are triggered by the ACTH from the anterior pituitary now let's look at the functions of uh, the functions of the the hormones now, when you take glucocorticoid, the name should even give you an idea that it's responsible for glucose metabolism, okay? So if you remember earlier on, an example is cortisol, okay? And I said cortisol was an anti-insulin hormone, which implies that it's going to function, um, um, it's going to function um, like um, like glucagon, okay, and growth hormone and um, epinephrine, okay. So these these hormones are we call them the anti-insulin hormones. Cortisol, okay, epinephrine, glucagon, and then growth hormone. These these four hormones. Are anti insulin hormones. So, what they are going to do is that if insulin causes the cells to absorb glucose, okay, these hormones are rather going to lead to increased blood glucose level. And they can do this by increasing glycogenolysis, that is, breakdown of glycogen, or gluconeogenesis, that is, increased um, new glucose synthesis, okay. So, that is the first function. So the first function of this is that it increases the blood glucose level. Okay, true, sorry, true gluconeogenesis in the liver. Okay, aside that, it also functions by converting um, um, fat, by breaking down fat and then amino acid, okay? Remember, I mean proteins, if you, if you break down proteins, you get amino acid. And some of these amino acids can be used for gluconeogenesis. Okay, good. So other functions of glucocorticoid. Okay, so they increase protein and fat catabolism, as I said it in the previous um, slide. Okay, so it causes proteins to break down, and also fats to break down, and it increases hepatic gluconeogenesis, as I have explained. Okay, and it also inhibit ACTH. That's a, the negative feedback mechanism. Okay. And glucocorticoids also have a function of increasing blood pressure. Okay. So what they do is that they, they make the arterials sensitive to, to the action of no, no adrenaline. Okay. And hence, increase blood pressure. So if I ask, why is it that Cushing's, syndrome, Cushing's syndrome, they come with hypertension? 
you should be able to explain why people with Cushing syndrome have hypertension. Okay, aside the mineralocorticoid function of cortisol, which leads to reabsorption of sodium and water, okay, which, which can cause hypertension. It can the, the cortisol or the glucocorticoids can also directly um, um, increase the sensitivity of our, of the arterioles to um, vasoconstrictors, okay, and hence increasing the um, the blood pressure. Okay, um, so what 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 it can also do is that it can also lead to um, increase water excretion. Okay, and then we will look at this later on. Good. One thing about glucocorticoid that everyone should know is that they have anti anti-inflammatory effects. So as I mean for the clinical year students who, are, who have joined, you you notice that we use we use cortisol or glucocorticoid, okay, or uh, drugs in this family to treat inflammatory disease. Okay, so for example. We say we, we give steroids to treat some of the chronic inflammatory diseases, okay? Okay, like if you have someone with arthritis, okay, chronic arthritis, maybe rheumatoid arthritis or most of those arthritis, we give them steroids, usually glucose. I mean, they are in this family, prednisolone and other stuff, okay? They have anti-inflammatory effects. Good. So these are some of the, the, the conditions they used to treat. Asthma, you know asthma is an infl inflammatory condition, okay? Chronic inflammatory, reversible. Okay, so um, we can give them glucocorticoids. So once again, um, we know we, we, we give them prednisolone, okay? Asthma, asthmatic patients. And that's, prednisolone is, is also one under these class of drugs and they are used to control the asthma, okay. Also, um, I'm sure you, you guys did organ transplant. You know that if someone has received um, a transplanted organ, we have to give um, um, reduce their immune system. So glucocorticoid also acts or also reduce the immune system. Okay. So remember that people with with Cushing syndrome who have high levels of glucocorticoid, remember that they are prone to infections okay and it is an immunocompromised state okay and as i said it's also used to treat other inflammatory conditions good now let's look at cortisol so um as i said the the, the commonest um glucocorticoid we'll be talking about is cortisol okay and then remember that about 95% of the cortisol is bound to protein, okay? That protein is cortisol binding protein. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or transcortin. Trans means transporter of cortisol. Cortin, okay, transcortin. So is the is the just like any other hormone or enzyme, is the unbound form which is biologically active. But whenever we say we are measuring the total. Um, cortisol level. That's we are we are measuring both the bound and the unbound. Okay, so remember that. Now, yesterday, I emphasized that the release of cortisol is, or, or the maximum amount of cortisol is released in the morning, between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. Okay, and I said that it's just we, we know cortisol um, prepares one for an activity. Okay, it prepares one for an activity. So one explanation we can give is that. When you wake up in the morning, you are going to work throughout the day. So you need to have that cortisol to, to keep you active, okay? The lowest um, amount is recorded at midnight, okay? Usually 11 to 12 midnight. Okay, so we are, we are done with cortisol and the glucocorticoid. We've seen the functions and then we've seen how they are transported and we've seen how they are released, okay? Let's go to the mineralocorticoid. An example of the mineralocorticoid is 
is, is the aldosterone. Function of aldosterone. We've said this over and over and over again. Okay? The first function or the most important function of aldosterone is for sodium absorption at the collecting, sorry, at the, at the distal convoluted tube. It aids in sodium reabsorption. Okay? And wherever sodium goes, water follows. So after the sodium or in the process of sodium reabsorption, water also is reabsorbed, okay? And this reabsorption of sodium is at the expense of potassium and H plus ion, okay? Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you have high levels of aldosterone, note that you are going to get high levels of sodium in your, in your blood, which is um, um, hypernatremia. And you are going to lose a lot of potassium, okay? Which is going to lead to, um, how do you call it? Um, um, hypokalemia, okay? And also, um, at times, it's also going to lead to um, excretion of H plus ion, so it can cause um, alkalosis. So if you put everything together, someone with excessive aldosterone or gas, hypernatremia, hypokalemia, and then metabolic alkalosis, okay? Good. Remember that um, the aldosterone is also its main function is to maintain the blood pressure, okay? And remember, it's produced via the renin um, angiotensin aldosterone system, okay? So what else, aside this, what else can aldosterone do? So because the aim of aldosterone is to conserve salt, okay? What it's going to do is that it's going to reduce the loss of sodium in sweat okay, or in perspiration. Okay, so this is something that I want you to know. What, what stimulates aldosterone production? Reduce blood um, sodium levels. And this will be picked up by the gastro glomerular apparatus and then lead to production of renin. So low blood sodium levels. Two, low blood pressure. If you have low, low blood pressure, you also stimulate aldosterone production, okay? And also someone with high potassium level, because aldosterone helps in secretion or excretion of potassium, if you have high potassium levels, you are going to produce a lot of aldosterone, okay? And we know angiotensin II is, is going to um, act on aldosterone synthesis for it to produce aldosterone. And then obviously ACTH, um, ACTH can also stimulate aldosterone production as well as cortisol. We, we already know ACTH stimulates cortisol production. Okay. Um, so the, the reticularis, okay, the, the reticularis, as we said, is responsible for production of the, of the sex hormone. Okay, I think someone is missing. It's not an Please, can you hear me? Okay, please, can you guys hear me? Someone is saying he can't hear. Okay. Okay, good. So when we take the adrenal cortex, okay, when, when you take the ad adrenal cortex, um, we, we have the reticularis, okay. And then the, the reticularis is responsible for producing the sex hormones, okay. The sex hormones we are going to look at is these ones, the androstenodion, and then the DHEA, okay, DHEA, and the DHEA sulfate. Now these two, okay, the androstenodyne and then the DHEA can also be produced by the, the testes, okay, but the DHEA sulfate, that one is only produced by the adrenal gland, 
okay so and we can use that to distinguish so for example if someone has adrenal insufficiency okay and then we ask you that between this um, these three hormones which one will you measure if you measure this one okay you might not you, you might not get the accurate level because maybe the testosterone sorry the testes might have produced this this androgen okay but the sulfate one is a surrogate marker for um, um, adrenal function okay because the dhe is sulfate is only produced by the adrenal glands okay good now the function of so we call these ones androgens Okay, so these hormones are androgens. Okay. Um, some of them are, so note androgens are produced in the testes, the ovaries, as well as the adrenal glands, okay. And then the androgens are responsible for, for initiation and, and or, or initiation of puberty and then maintenance of the secondary sexual characteristics, okay. Um, the major androgen in males is the testosterone. But we have the DH, C, which is a dihydrotestosterone. And if you remember from the development of the uh, male um, genitalia, okay, we know that DHT is very important. Yeah, so, so someone is asking me to go over the DHEA. So I'm saying that the, the normal DHEA can be produced also by the testes okay but the sulfated one is only produced by the adrenal gland so if someone is having an, an adrenal um, dysfunction okay and then and then you are asked to measure one of these you know, the androgens um, the sulfated ones are the ones we measure because those ones are only restricted to the to the not the bullet, the, the adrenal gland. Okay. Now, the first condition we are going to look at is Cushing's syndrome. So, Cushing's syndrome, you see, I didn't say Cushing's disease. I'm saying Cushing's syndrome. Okay. Now, when you talk about Cushing's, so note that Cushing's is when you have a lot of glucocorticoids, okay? Glucocorticoids, high levels of glucocorticoids or high levels of cortisol. Now, I'm saying Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's syndrome is different from Cushing's disease, okay? And we, we will note the difference. So this is someone who has high levels of cortisol. Level. Now, the question is, why, why is that this patient has high levels of cortisol? So there are a lot of causes of this syndrome. This syndrome is going to lead to high levels of cortisol production. Okay. Good. And as I said, it might also have some mineral you know, corticoid and androgen effects. Okay. But the most important one is the increased um, glucocorticoid um, effect. Okay. And this condition is usually associated with diabetes hypertension you know those kind of metabolic syndrome okay good now what can cause an increase in cortisol level so they are less we are going to group them into three so the first okay first of all let, let me let me give you this group let's first group them them into two okay so the first group and that is the most common or the commonest cause of Cushing's syndrome, and that is iatrogenic. Okay, iatrogenic. So you and um, I earlier want to emphasize that we give people cortisol to treat various conditions. Okay, if you give them this these drugs, cortisol, obviously it will increase their their blood cortisol levels, and then it will give them this condition. So far, uh, far most, this is the commonest cause of Cushing's syndrome. That's the iatrogenic ones, usually as a result of the drugs that they are on. If they are on steroids, 
blacks, okay? Someone who is using topical steroids. The ladies, go and buy um, topical steroids. You want to be fair. It's also steroids. It can give you this complication. Good. Now, the second one is actually um, pathological causes. And for the pathological causes, I want you to group them into three. So the first one, let's take it from the pituitary gland. So you could have a condition, a tumor of the pituitary gland, such that the tumor is producing high levels of ACTH. And this high levels of ACTH is going to cause the adrenal gland to produce high levels of cortisol. So this is one mechanism. The second mechanism is this. Okay, you could have a tumor somewhere else. Okay, a tumor somewhere else. Not in the pituitary, somewhere else. And that tumor somewhere else is producing ACTH. And that ACTH is causing the adrenal cortex to produce a lot of glucocorticoids. So we call this one ectopic ACTH tumor. Okay, or ectopic tumors producing ACTH. Then the third possibility is when you have the adrenal gland itself. Just there's a tumor of the adrenal gland itself, and that tumor is producing a lot of uh, cortisol. Okay, this time it has nothing to do with ACTH. The tumor is in the adrenal gland, and then the, the that tumor is independently producing. Uh, Cortisol. So with this, I've given you the causes of the causes of um, Cushing syndrome. So the first, first of all, group them into two: iatrogenic causes, patients who are on steroids, okay. And then the second one is um, pathological causes. And for the pathological causes, group them into three: pituitary cause. Okay, so the epitutary tumor producing a lot of ACTH, ACTH, okay? Then the third one is an ectopic tumor, which is also producing excess ACTH. And the last one is the tumor of the adrenal gland producing cortisol. So with this, you've organized the knowledge in your head. You don't need to open any textbook, okay? When you organize the learning like this, it sticks for a long time, but when you are learning it anyhow, you notice that you forget it's okay. So always organize it nicely. Okay, good. Now, I said for the pathological ones, there, there is one in which there is a, a tumor of the pituitary gland producing ACTH. This type is what is called Cushing's disease. So Cushing's disease is a cause of Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's disease is when you have a tumor of the pituitary gland, which is producing a lot of ACTH. And that ACTH is going to cause the adrenal cortex to produce a lot of glucocorticoid. That is Cushing's disease. And Cushing's disease is different from Cushing's syndrome. Cushing's disease is a cause of Cushing's syndrome. I hope this clear, uh, this point has been made clear. Good. So, um, th this slide is going to put everything in perspective, as I have already said. So, this is the iatrogenic ones, which is as a result of glucocorticoid therapy given to some people for other diseases, as we said, diseases like asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, and prevention of organ transplant. We give them um, steroids, okay? That's the atrogenic cause, which is far, far, far more the, um, the most common cause of Cushing syndrome, okay? Then we have the ACTH, let's go to the top, ACTH dependent one. So these are the ones which depends on ACTH. An example being the tumor of the pituitary gland, which, is, which leads to a condition we call Cushing's disease, which produces a lot of ACTH, and that ACTH will cause the adrenal cortex to produce um, cortisol, okay? The other cause of, uh, uh, or the other type of ACTH dependent one is an ectopic tumor which is producing ACTH, okay? 
and you could have bronchial cancers if you have bronchial cancers okay and then um there's also another one which is which it's, it's not really common but later on we will see when you get to Addison's disease that some in some of their their management we give them ACTH okay so people on ACTH therapy too can can also in, in the long term develop cushion syndrome okay then we have the ACTH independent uh, yeah the independent ones are someone who have that's the tumor of the adrenal gland itself producing the the cortisol okay this tumor could be benign which is an adenoma or it could be malignancy which is an adrenal carcinoma good now what are the clinical features of Cushing's disease we will come to that one okay but I have emphasized that here there is a lot of um, um, glucocorticoids and we, we saw the function, we saw some of the if, um, effect of glucocorticoid, okay, in increasing blood sugar level, in increasing blood pressure, okay, in causing uh, protein breakdown and fat breakdown, okay, being anti-inflammatory, being um, um, being anti um, or um, reducing the immune immune system okay good and um, remember that the glucocorticoids also have some other um, uh, mineral corticoid um, functions okay so they can also in a way lead to sodium retention it can cause hypertension and can cause potassium wasting leading to hypokalemia okay now re remember this that's um the the synthesized glucocorticoid have no mineral corticoid action so the ones the the ones so that so that means that the iatrogenic causes okay will not cause um sodium retention hypertension and hypokalemia because the synthetic glucocorticoid have no mineral corticoid activity but the the endogenous um, glucocorticoids have both mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid activity. Now, there's a condition which we call pseudo cushion syndrome. For this one, the patient appear, we look at the physical appearance, okay, but they appear like someone who have cushion syndrome, okay, but when you do the investigation, you realize that these people, they don't have cushion syndrome, okay, and there are three, three situations that can present as pseudo cushion syndrome okay um i i always use um um you can use ado okay like ado or or o d -E, order or something like that okay it's oda so o stands for obesity d stand for depression a stand for alcoholism so these three obesity depression alcoholism oda these three conditions present with what is called the pseudo cushions syndrome okay good so features of cushion syndrome the feature features of cushion syndrome are as a result of the increased glucocorticoid or cortisol levels okay now if you remember what cortisol does we said cortisol breaks down proteins and it also breaks down fats okay so um, dependent so let's see so there is truncal obesity now the reason for this obesity okay when you say truncal obesity and that's ob obesity of the of the of the trunk okay of, of the trunk okay you see that the person's abdomen is protruding okay and then they have what is called a moon face or oh, their, their face is full of fat okay and um, this what causes this is, is, is what is called the abnormal abnormal redistribution of fat okay so so the fat breaks down from where they are normally supposed to be and they accumulate in um the face and then the abdomen okay so there is trunk out obesity um, good there's also thinning of the skin this is because the subcutaneous tissue okay the fat in the subcutaneous tissues have been um, broken down okay and been redistributed okay good and so that leads to the thin of the skin 
and the thin of the skin will lead to leads to um, stretch marks. So these are people who have uh, some stretch. I'm not saying everyone who has stretch marks has Cushing syndrome, but those with Cushing syndrome they usually um, appear with purple purple stretch marks. Okay, and excessive bruising. This is because their blood vessels become very weak because collagen is the collagen produced is not strong; it's being broken down. So they have that predilection to um, ease bruising. Okay, and they also have what is called the hirsutism. Um, the hirsutism means that they have a lot of hair. Okay, and this is because of the. Um, and if you remember, I said that those with Cushing's syndrome. Okay. Um, especially the ACTH type, even the testosterone levels are also increased, okay? So that leads to the, um, how do you call it? The hirsutism, which is hair, excessive hair. Then you have skin pigmentation. Now, if you remember carefully, um, I said yesterday that the ACTH, okay, um, resembles the MSH, which is melanocytes stimulating hormone. They are all coming from the same precursor, the POMC gene, the pong, uh, POMC gene, okay? So when that one is spliced, you get ACTH and MSH. And this ACTH can therefore um, have some um, effects as the MSH. MSH is melanocyte stimulating, and we stimulate melanin to produce the dark pigment of the skin. So that means that if you have excessive ACTH, the excess ACTH can um, can um, um, activate the or stimulate the melanocytes to produce excessive melanin, causing dark pigmentation of the skin as well as the oral mucosa. Okay, and we've explained the hypertension. Now, the hypertension is um, either due to the increased sensitivity of the arterial to the noradrenaline, okay, and hence. That will cause vessel constriction, and this vessel constriction, generalized vessel constriction, will increase total peripheral resistance and hence the hypertension. And also, the hypertension too can be due to the mineralocorticoid effect of glucocorticoids, which is as a result, I mean, which which leads to reabsorption of sodium and water, hence causing the hypertension. The glucose intolerance is actually um, because these people are, as I said, they are. Um, obese and other stuff, okay. Obesity and increased lipid levels can cause um, um, insulin resistance, and that insulin resistance can lead to glucose intolerance, okay. Just like a diabetes patient, muscle weakness and wasting. Remember, we said one function of the glucocorticoid is that it breaks down proteins, so there is protein breakdown, okay, and in, of the muscles. And when this happens, the muscles become very, very weak. Okay, and then the muscles are wasted. And menstrual irregularities, okay, this is as a result of the increased androgen levels. Okay, so as I said, Cushing syndrome, um, though mostly it's the glucocorticoid levels which are increased, but there are some mineral corticoid and then some androgen effects, okay, and that androgen effects in females it can cause irregular. Um, irregularities in the menstrual cycle as well as excessive hair. So you see that there are some women with a lot of beard, okay? Hmm. That this could be a possibility, okay? There are other causes as well. Back pain is as a result of the osteoporosis, which is as a result of bone breakdown from the cushions um, or the glucocorticoid effect of cortisol, okay? Not only this, but they, this, this also can cause um, psychiatric disturbances okay and um, depression now all these things are features of Cushing's syndrome and all these things are also side effects most of them are side effects of using um, steroids okay so when they ask what are the side effects of steroids they are almost just like these ones but remember that the synthetic steroids do not have the mineral corticoid and then the um, how do you call it the um, androgen activities or effects. Good. So now, the, the general biochemistry, as I have said, okay, there will be hypokalemia, there will be glucose intolerance, metabolic acidosis, hypernatremia, all as a result of 
the mineralocorticoid effects of cortisol. Please, any questions so far? Okay. So let's let's look at some of the, the investigations, okay? Um then we end we, we end the session. So now when you when you look at the investigations, yes, okay, someone has a question. Um Stella, someone call Stella. Your hand is up. Okay, let's continue. So for the for the investigations, as I said, we have the screening one. Okay, then we have the confirmatory one. So the screening one is used to screen and say, no, this one has what is called Cushing syndrome. Okay, this one is Cushing syndrome. The confirmatory test is to find out the source of it, what is causing the Cushing syndrome. Okay, good. So there are three things you could do under the, the screening for cushion. Okay. So there are, there are three things that you could do. So the first the first thing you could do is what is called the 24 hour urinary cortisol exclusion. Okay, so that means that within 24 hours you take all the you take the the cortisol uh, uh, um, levels in the, the urine, okay. 24 hour period. Okay, you allow the you collect all the persons during over 24 hours, and you, you measure the, the the cortisol levels. Okay, um, I, I don't think you need the values. Okay, so that's one one thing you could do. Then the second thing you could do is what is called the low dose dexamethasone suppression test. So remember this also. This is a suppression test. Okay. So what happens is this. Remember, dexamethasone is also um, um, a synthetic, um, how do you call it, glucocorticoid, okay? So what this, if, if you give this, what it's supposed to do, okay, is that it's supposed to, um, if you give it this in a normal person, okay, it's supposed to give a negative feedback to the hypothalamus and the pituitary, so that at the long term, you reduce your cortisol production, okay? So that's the function of dexamethasone, okay? I mean, one thing dexamethasone does, okay? So it suppresses ACTH release, as well as suppressing the cortisol release, okay? So, um, let's see. So the, the low dose, so now if this person has Cushing syndrome, when you give them this low dose, okay, it's, it's not going to suppress the cortisol. Still, uh, the cortisol production is going to be high. Okay, so what do you do? So we give them um, um, one, one milligram of um, um, dexamethasone, okay? Okay, and, 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 and what you do is that, um, um you you can you can give it at 11 p.m remember we said 11 p.m is when the production is low okay and then you, you expect that early in the morning um i mean normally early in the morning the cortisol production should be high okay but when you give the dexamethasone okay in a normal patient it's supposed to suppress the production of cortisol so if you give dexamethasone to a normal patient at 11 p.m. At 8 p.m., when you take the blood levels, you realize that the cortisol production has, really, uh, has, has been reduced because the dexamethasone has suppressed the cortisol production, okay? But this is not so for someone who has Cushing syndrome. So for those with Cushing syndrome, remember that the low dose dexamethasone suppression test does not work, okay? So, um, yes. Good. So we've seen two things. We, we've seen the 24-hour urinary cortisol and then the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. These are screening tests, okay? And these are the ones which are usually done. Okay, but there's another another screening test which we do, which is 
the dynamic rhythm of plasma okay so with, with this one as as we as we said in normal people highest production 8 a.m lowest production 11 p.m okay but you notice that for these people with cortisol okay there is there, there is a um variation okay we, we don't usually do this one okay good there's also an, another one that we do which is the insulin hypoglycemia text test okay so for this one what happens is that remember um we said that glucocorticoid will increase the blood um, blood glucose levels okay so if for for any normal person if you give the person insulin okay the glucose levels will go down because insulin will cause the cells to reuptake um um what do you call it glucose okay mm -hmm. so for for how do you call it for patients with cushion syndrome okay and um, i don't want to go into the details of, of this test okay um you will notice that um it doesn't work the the, the insulin um, does not induce this hypoglycemia as seen in the normal patients okay good so so after doing these um tests okay after doing these screening tests okay it came positive that no this person has cushion syndrome because the cortisol levels are high then the next thing you are going to do is that okay if this person has cushion syndrome of all the causes of the cushion syndrome that we discussed which of them could it be okay so one could it be uh um how do you call it could it be um nitrogenic so you take a good history and find out whether the, the 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 person is using any drugs okay good then the next question you ask is that no could this be coming from the pituitary gland that is cushion's disease or could it could this be an ectopic tumor somewhere which is producing ACTH or finally could this be the adrenal gland tumor producing a lot of is um, a lot of cortisol so with these three questions that we are going to ask okay you are going to perform certain investigation and the investigation that we are going to do is going to give you one of them okay or it's going to point to one of them so what you could do is that is that you can measure the ACTH levels okay if you measure the ACTH levels and it's high then obviously you know that it's either coming from the pituitary gland or it's coming from a tumor somewhere producing the ACTH. ACTH okay. Then obviously you rule out the the adrenal gland. Okay. Now some someone can ask this question that uh, if we if we know that the tumor the tumor can be in the pituitary gland or the tumor can be in the abdomen or the tumor can be in the adrenal gland. Why don't we just do MRI of, of, of the whole body and then that will save us all this investigation. Because obviously, if, if it's not iatrogenic, then it's a tumor somewhere. So why don't we just do MRI of the whole body and, and locate this tumor? Okay, that's a valid question. But, but the answer is that if, if, even if we take a normal human being, okay, and we do CT scan, Okay, we can find some tumors, some benign tumors somewhere. Okay, we call those ones incidentalomas. Okay, that means that it's an incidental finding. So incidental oma, incidentaloma. Okay, so incidental tumors. Okay, those ones they don't cause anything. So imagine I I do an, an MRI of the adrenal gland, and and let's assume it was an incidentaloma. Okay, it's a benign tumor somewhere which doesn't have any effect. Okay, I'll straight away um, say that, no, okay, it's coming from this um, gland over there, okay? Then you go in and do the surgery. And later on, you, you still realize that the disease condition persists because the adrenal gland that you're going to take away, the tumor over there was a benign tumor somewhere. So you have to do all these investigations so that all these investigations can point to one organ so that you direct your your scan to that organ and then you take maybe the CT scan or the MRI, sorry an MRI which is very 
sensitive to soft tissues. Okay, you do the MRI, and then um, it will direct your nest or your feather management. Okay, good. So you do the ACTH, and then if the ACTH levels are high or excessively high, then you know that you are dealing with an ACTH producing tumor, which could be coming from the pituitary gland or coming from an ectopic tumor somewhere. Good. So then, what, what do you do next? Okay. So then, the next thing you do is that, now you've seen that, you've seen that this tumor, this tumor is coming from either the pituitary gland or an, an, an ectopic or an ectopic um, tumor somewhere, maybe in the lungs or in the GIT somewhere, okay? So now the next thing you do is that, no, um, I, I know this, I know there's a tumor somewhere in this person's body and this tumor is producing a lot of ACTs. So this, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give this patient high dose of dexamethasone high dose of dexamethasone. Okay, what this high dose of dexamethasone is going to do is that if that tumor is from the pituitary gland, the high dose dexamethasone can suppress the ACTH production. Remember, low dose dexamethasone is not going to suppress any ACTH or cortisol production, low dose, okay? But remember the pituitary gland is an obedient gland, okay? So if you increase the dexamethasone and you give a high dose dexamethasone, which is four milligram, okay? You give a high dose, um, okay, okay, in your slide, okay, depending on how, how you give it, okay, here, in your slide, they are saying you give two milligram six hourly for um, eight days, so, okay. Okay, um, we can go with this. So if, if you give this high dose dexamethasone, um, what's going to happen um, is that if the tumor is coming from the pituitary gland, the high dose dexamethasone can suppress the ACTH production from the end products inhibition, okay? But if the, the um, ACTH is coming from an ectopic gland somewhere in the, in the GIT or in the lungs, the high dose dexamethasone is not going to suppress it. So that means that, first of all, so let me put everything together in perspective so we understand. So first of all, we've done, we, we see a patient, the patient comes with all the clinical conditions and we suspect Cushing's disease, sorry, Cushing's syndrome. Then th that, with that clinical um, suspicion, we, we perform some screening tests, okay? The screening test could be the 24 hour urine cortisol levels. That's one. Two, the second thing we, we, can, we can do is the low dose dexamethasone test, okay? The, the low dose dexamethasone test, okay, in normal patients, it can suppress the cortisol production. 24 hour cortisol production, if it's um, excessive, okay, then we can say, no, this person indeed has Cushing syndrome. Now, where, what is causing it? Is it iatrogenic? Find out from the history whether the patient is on any medication. Or if not, then you are thinking of a tumor somewhere. Is the tumor in the pituitary gland? Is the tumor elsewhere in the body, the lungs or the GIT? Or the tumor is in the adrenal gland? The tumor in the pituitary gland and the tumor elsewhere in the body, they are all ACTH dependent. So what you do is that you measure the ACTH levels. If these ACTH levels are high, then it will limit your options to a tumor in the pituitary gland and a tumor elsewhere in the body, okay? Good then what you do is that in order to distinguish between these two tumors, is it in the pituitary gland or is it elsewhere in the body? Then what you do is that you give the high dose dexamethasone test, okay? The high dose dexamethasone test, what it's going to do is that if the pituitary, if the tumor is in the pituitary gland, then it will suppress the ACTH production and cortisol production. So with this, we are done. Okay, so one, clinical suspicions with all the symptoms and signs we talked about. Two, confirmation test, either 24-hour urine cortisol test or the low-dose dexamethasone test. Then you, confirm, you, 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 you screen them for the Cushing syndrome. The next thing you do is that you want to find out what's causing it. 
Is it iatrogenic? Is it coming from the, the pituitary? Is it coming from the adrenal gland? Or is it coming from elsewhere? If you measure the ACTH level and the ACTH level are very low, then obviously the tumor is coming from the adrenal gland, which is producing the, the cortisol because that tumor is ACTH independent, okay? If you measure the ACTH level and the ACTH levels are high, then obviously it's either from the pituitary gland or from elsewhere in the body. That's mainly either the lungs or the GIT. What you do is you give the high dose dexamethasone test. If, you, if you're able to suppress the ACTH production, then it's coming from the pituitary. If, if you can't put, um, suppress it, then it's coming from the um, elsewhere in, in the body, either the lungs or the GIT. Other symptoms can point also to this, okay? Then the, the next thing you do is that you do your scan. If it points to the pituitary gland, you do an um, MRI of the pituitary, okay? And you see the tumor. Okay. Then for treatment, you go and then you, you remove the, the tumor, okay? Now, as I said, Cushing's disease is when you have the ACTH producing tumor of the pituitary gland. Okay, so that's the summary. Please, any questions so far? Please, any questions? There are questions in the chat room. Okay. Wait, there are a lot of questions here. Let me see. Okay, so someone said that I should repeat the course. So first, I said the questions are two. Uh, um, sorry, the causes. The causes are to either iatrogenic or pathological. Under the pathological, either ACTH dependent, okay? If it's ACTH dependent, it could either be coming from the pituitary gland or the um, elsewhere in the body. That's the lungs or the GIT, okay? Then we have the adrenal tumors, okay? The adrenal tumors, they produce only the cortisol, okay? So they are not ACT dependent, okay? So that means that when you measure the, the levels of ACT, ACTH, it will be very low. Okay, the next question. Are the iatrogenic causes of Cushing's disease preventable or treatable? Good. So it's both, okay? So if um, for, for, for someone who must be on the, the how do you call this? The, um, someone who must be on the drugs, okay? Then you treat it, okay? But for someone who is just using drugs like um, what do you call it? Topical steroids. I mean, you can you can tell them to stop, and then um, they will come back. They they may um, resume their their shape. Okay, but even even that, you you still need to treat the the condition. Um, which other question? So someone said that you explained the dexamethasone test again. So we have two of them. The the low dose, the low dose. Um, the low dose dexamethasone test, okay? That one, once, if, if you have Cushing's syndrome, that low dose is not going to do anything. It's so small that it cannot suppress the, um, it cannot suppress the, the cortisol production, okay? Good. But the high dose dexamethasone test is used to, because it's high, it can suppress pituitary tumors producing ACTH. So that, that one is used to distinguish between ACTH producing tumors, whether they are coming from the pituitary gland or they are coming from elsewhere. The pituitary runs respond to ACT, uh, um, high dose dexamethasone test, okay? And if I say it responds to it, it means that later on when you measure the cortisol level, you realize that the cortisol levels have been reduced. Okay, so I think I've answered all the questions over here. Good. So, um, 